Hello mind mappers and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over The Happiness of Pursuit by Chris Guillebeau, finding the quest that will bring purpose to your life. And Chris is the author of The $100 Startup. This book is filled with stories of people that have found purpose, have found passion, and have set really big goals or created quests for themselves and have found happiness pursuing those goals or pursuing that quest. Without any further ado, if you're interested in purpose, goal setting, or finding happiness in your own life, this book is perfect for you. Let's get directly into the introduction. Let's see what Chris has to say about the book. I believe I've pulled out a quote that gives us a good overview of what we can expect to learn. In addition to satisfying my own curiosity, I wrote this book to inspire you to attempt something remarkable on your own. So this book is really all kind of a call to action to find your own quest. If you look closely here, and you'll see a path you can follow, no matter what your goal is. Everyone who pursues a quest learns many lessons along the way. Some relate to accomplishment, disillusionment, joy, and sacrifice. Others to specific project at hand. But what if you could learn these lessons a little bit earlier? What if you could study with those who've invested years, sometimes decades, in the relentless pursuit of their dreams? That learning opportunity is what this book is all about. You'll sit with people who have pursued big adventures and crafted their lives of purpose around something that they found deeply meaningful. You'll hear stories and lessons, and you'll learn what happened along the way. But more important, you'll learn why it happened and why it matters. It's my job as the author to provide a framework and issue a challenge. It's yours to decide on the next steps. So quick introduction here. As Chris says, this book is filled with stories of people who have set out on a big adventure or set out on a quest, as he calls it, and have learned quite a lot along the way. Of course, one way to learn those things is to set out on a quest of your own. But the way that the book is going to teach us is through the quests of other people, showing us the things that they've learned along the way. And Chris is, of course, also providing us a framework and issuing a challenge. Some of that framework I'll be sharing here today and all of the challenge will be interwoven into the mind map so that you can actually take action on your end. Perhaps reading about others' stories will prompt you to think about your own life. What excites you? What bothers you? If you could do anything at all without regard to time or money, what would it be? These are all really great questions. And here today, we're going to be learning through pursuit. This, challenge, this channel is all about learning. We learn about things like habits, productivity, goal setting, and purpose. But what is all that learning worth if we don't put it to use? As the Stoics day, we want to be warriors of the mind and not librarians of the mind. In other words, we want to take in information and use it in our lives to either better our own lives or the lives of others. And really... We don't want to just stack up information like a librarian would, knowing where to find the right information, but never actually using it. And of course, what the warriors need? They need a quest. That's what this book is all about. A quest is the greatest learning tool. It's profoundly motivating, and it forces you out of your comfort zone, something that just reading books won't normally do. It draws people towards you on the same journey, which is absolutely amazing. As I've started this YouTube channel and created these videos for you, I've made so many friends online, of course, that are very interested in personal growth and personal development. That is so amazing to me, and I want you guys to keep reaching out. There's an email attached to this YouTube channel, of course. If you want to reach out, I'd be happy to speak with you. It allows for personal growth to build upon itself rather than learning in chunks that don't actually connect. Now, this is something that I've been thinking about quite a lot recently, is that when we're learning, we want to make sure that the thing that we're learning connects to something real. And if it doesn't connect to something real, two things are likely to happen. Number one, we're very likely to forget it. And number two, we're very likely to not actually get any benefit from that information. If we can't connect something to our lives, in our lives, to the information that we're learning, it's almost useless. So that's what this book is all about. We're going to be connecting the information in the book directly to our lives and hopefully finding you your very own quest. Now let's talk a little bit about mind mapping before we get into this. You can get the most out of these mind maps by following along. You can find the process of how I mind map plus 
all 50 plus mind map templates, including this one, at the link down below. It's at themindmapguide.com, and following along will help you learn more, remember better, and apply these books to your life. I've also got select masterclasses on that website. Masterclasses on things like goal setting, on purpose, on habits, things that can help you kind of skip the line. I've read dozens and dozens of books on particular topics. I've implemented the tactics and techniques into my own life, into the lives of my coaching clients, and I'm bringing that wisdom all to you in one two-hour-long masterclass. Let's talk about our very first big idea here, a quest. A quest, we decided, is something bigger. It takes more time and requires more commitment than general life improvement. So this is talking about the difference between uh, a quest or just kind of reading personal development books or reading fi financial books or whatever you're doing. You're kind of setting out on general life improvement, but a quest is something a little different. Still though, what exactly is a quest? How do you define it? Definitely a good question. After much consideration, here are the criteria that we settled on. A quest has a clear goal and a specific end point. You can clearly explain a quest in a sentence or two. Every quest has a beginning, and sooner or later, every quest will come to an end. A quest presents a clear challenge. A quest requires sacrifice of some kind. A quest is often driven by a calling or a sense of mission. A quest requires a series of small steps and incremental progress towards the goal. To sum it up, a quest is a journey towards something specific with a number of challenges throughout. Most quests also require a series of logical steps in some kind of personal growth. So that's what a quest is. And we've talked a little bit about why a quest is important and how learning through quests is one of the best ways to learn in my opinion. Committing to a quest is the best thing that you can do for your own personal development. A quest forces you out of the, into the ocean and that's where we learn. But a quest is more than just running a marathon or getting a promotion. That's for sure. Those are more specific goals. A quest is something that connects you to your highest self through consistently asking you to grow in ability, belief, and commitment, among many other things. So how would we decide on our quest? Well, I've created a little five-step framework for you here. First, we need to have a clear goal, ideally one that can be explained in a sentence or two. That goal needs to be actually challenging and require personal growth. For example, if I set a goal to wake up tomorrow morning, eh, that's probably not going to require that much personal growth. But if I set a goal of putting out 100 videos a year next year, that's going to require quite a lot of personal growth in both time management, in my reading ability, and many other areas of my life. Step number three is the quest is going to require some sacrifice of time, of money, of security, or etc. You're going to have to sacrifice something in order to accomplish what you are really setting out to accomplish. Quests are connected to something bigger, maybe a calling or a mission, a mission, and they're meaningful, not necessarily meaningful to everyone, but meaningful to you. And you feel some sort of a calling towards the quest. Number five, a quest isn't one big leap. It requires small incremental steps towards a goal. So you need to kind of consistently codify and consistently clarify what your end quest is going to be, right? So say, for example, you know, you've watched all of the hero movies out there and they need to go and notify someone in a, in a faraway city that some warring tribe is coming towards them, right? That's kind of the, the basic template of most hero movies. But along the way, they find little side quests. Something happens over here and they need to slay a dragon. Something happens over there and they need to save a princess. They set out with one particular goal, but along the way, they notice a bunch of small little quests. So you need to be willing to make those small incremental steps towards your goal instead of getting everything done all in one step. So let's find your quest. Let's look into what your quest might be. Step number one, what do you feel called to do? This might take some time to find. For example, you have to be very careful that you're not being called to do something that someone else told you once upon a time was a good career or was a good business that you could start or etc. It's very difficult to find what you really feel called to do. And I recommend that you spend quite a lot of time meditating on this. We'll talk about some ways that you can find this a little easier in a couple other steps. But 
Step number two is to connect that calling to a goal. So after you know what you feel called to do, what do you want to accomplish? Make it specific and short. Make sure that you know exactly what you want to do. Now, this is kind of getting into goal setting and this is getting into a lot of the things that we've talked about on the channel already, is that if it's not specific and short, it's going to be very easy for you to forget about it. So we need to make sure that you are actually kind of putting it down on paper. You're actually making sure that you know what you truly want to do. Step number three is to break down the first few steps. What do you need to do? A couple steps along the way, right? For example, if you're going to start a business, you need to create a business plan or you're going to get your first paying customer or any number of small first few steps. Step number four is to continue to break down the steps ahead of you and commit to following through. Now, the reason that I didn't say plan your goal all the way out until the very end, right from the beginning, is because in my experience through starting multiple businesses and kind of setting out on a bunch of quests in my life, that even if I thought I knew what the end goal of the quest was, I never really knew how to get there. And quite often, I didn't actually know what the end goal was going to look like either. It's very difficult to see what point A looks like from point B. And life isn't quite as simple as a GPS where you're going to actually step by step write out the particular instructions to get to your end goal. So in my experience, break it down into the first few steps. What do you want to do? What's a small win that you can get and then move on from there? Constantly changing and constantly finding the next few steps that you're going to take. Our next big idea here is discontent. Not something that you would think about in a personal development book, but if you've ever felt a strange sense of sadness or alienation, there's a potential way out of that confusion. Just shift this feeling to a sense of purpose. It's not all about happiness, although happiness often results from doing something that you love. Instead, it's about challenge and fulfillment, finding the perfect combination of striving and achievement that comes from reaching a really big goal. And we've done a few book reviews on some of Sonia Libomirsky's work. One, for example, is The Myths of Happiness, where she talks a lot about how happiness is kind of a misnomer, right? Really what you're looking for is fulfillment. And the way that I like to think of fulfillment is the constant realization of a worthy goal. Now, the other piece of happiness in, in my own life, the one that I found from the books and how it's worked out in, in my own life is peace in motion. So as calm as I can possibly be, moving towards my big goal. Metaphorically, discontent is the match and inspiration is the kindling. When discontent leads to excitement, that's when you know you found your pursuit. So what's the point here? Have you ever felt like what you're doing isn't worth it? Like you're waking up in the morning, going to work and repeating it just like Groundhog Day. Most of us have felt like that at least at one point in our life. Often we look for things that give us happiness, like comfort food, movies, or sports, in order to feel a brief sense of happiness. But here's the thing, it's not happiness that we're missing. It's not a hit of dopamine that's going to solve our problem that we feel like we're on Groundhog Day. Happiness is a byproduct of fulfillment, and fulfillment is a byproduct of feeling like we're making progress towards that worthy ideal, or living up to our purpose that I spoke about before. So. If you want to be happy, get busy pursuing your quest. Will it be hard? Yes. Will there be days that you feel like giving up? Yes. Will there be people that try and stop you along the way or discourage you? Yes. But overcoming each of those obstacles leads to happiness. Continuing the Groundhog Day and covering up the sadness with that fake happy of the food or the movies or the sports simply isn't going to lead to lasting happiness and fulfillment. And if you want to learn a little bit more about this, again, I recommend The Myths of Happiness by Sonia Libermirsky, available right on this channel, a really great book about what truly makes us happy. So what if you're not happy right now? Discontent and unhappiness can actually be great motivators. So if you're unhappy or you're feeling like you're in Groundhog Day, sometimes if you focus your attention on that, it's going to be serious, seriously motivating to find what actually makes you happy or find what's going to fulfill you, right? Now, here's kind of another misnomer is that these feeling of discontent and unhappiness, they're not going to be long lasting forms of motivation. 
they're not going to be long lasting like pursuing your quest will, right? The constant realization of that worthy ideal, that kind of small steps along the way is the most motivating thing that you can get. But this discontent and this unhappiness don't need to be useless and they don't need to draw us down. They can lead us to exploring different options. I'm willing to maybe test out a couple of different things after work. I'm daydreaming about the different businesses that I might start. Exploring different options might lead you to what your quest really is. And in fact, this is a big piece of finding your calling. Not just meditating and thinking about it, but doing a bunch of small tests is a really good way to find out what your true calling is. Even unhappiness is helpful. Even discontent is helpful. If you view it in this way, it's a short-term motivator to find what's truly going to fulfill you, to find your quest, or to find your purpose, and to start the pursuit. Now, our next idea here I've highlighted in red because I think that calling is one of the most important points in this entire book. Calling. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Bob Dylan was asked about the word calling. Everybody has a calling, he said. Some have a high calling and some have a low calling. Everybody is called, but few are chosen. There's a lot of distraction for people, so you might not ever find the real you. And a lot of people don't. The real you, that's very deep. When asked how he would describe his own calling, here's how he answered. Mine? Well, it's not different than anybody else's. Some people are called to be a good sailor. Some people have a calling to be a good tiller of land. Some people are called to be a good friend. You have to be the best at whatever you are called at. Whatever you do, you ought to be the best at it. Highly skilled. It's about confidence, not arrogance. You have to know that you're the best, whether anybody tells you that or not. And embracing a calling is about being the best at something. Or it's doing something that you feel no one else can do. Not necessarily in a competitive manner where you have to beat someone else. But according to your own standard of what you know is true. Some of us discover a quest, and sometimes the quest discovers us. Whichever is the case with you, once you identify your calling, don't lose sight of it. So this is something pretty interesting here, right? So if you want to be the best tennis player in the world or the best basketball player in the world, it might be a little bit difficult, right? If you want to be like Bob Dylan, one of the best musicians in the world, that might be a little bit difficult. But what you can do is focus on being the best at being yourself. So if you're kind of the type of person that's making mind map videos on YouTube, I might not be the best person at summarizing books, but what I can be is the best at being myself, bringing my own experiences and my own kind of view on the world through these books and delivering it to you. And that's why I believe that I'm successful on YouTube is not necessarily because I'm the best book reviewer, so to speak, but because I'm continually being the best version of myself. And that's what the calling is really all about. I would say that the one calling that we all truly have is to become the highest version of ourself. And that's what's truly calling all of us. Of course, each of us is gonna have different aspects. Some of us will make music, some of us will be a carpenter, some of us will be a therapist. What you are doesn't matter. Your identity or your role doesn't matter. But becoming the best version of that that you can is the calling. Becoming the best version of you is the true calling. And to me, that's such a relief because we don't have to kind of compete against other people. We can compete against our former self. And that's a game that we can play forever. You don't age out of competing against yourself. And really, the game is flow. How long can we stay in a flow state? How much time can we stay in a flow state? If you don't know what flow is, it's a mental state in which a person performing some activity is fully immersed in the feeling of energized focus, full, of mo full involvement, enjoyment, and the process of the activity. It's best known, for example, as being in the zone in sports. But it's a lot more than that. It's a state where time melts away and we're 10 times more productive. That's right, one hour of flow-based work translates to 10 hours of non-flow-based work. The people in my life who are absolutely at their highest level always see whatever they do as a game. They don't focus much on the small outcomes. They focus on the consistent improvement 
competing with their previous self, as we talked about before, and not taking it too seriously. Finding your calling and becoming the highest version of yourself is the game that you can play forever. There's always room to be better. And the reason we want to focus on playing the game is because games are extremely good at getting us into the flow state. If you want to learn a little bit more about the flow state, I recommend that you check out the book Flow by Mihai Cheek Sent Me High. We've done a full book review on the channel. Deep Work by Cal Newport is also very good at explaining the flow state and how we can become the highest version of ourselves by spending more time in the flow state. I recommend that you check out both of those books. Again, both of them are available on the channel. Our next big idea here is to be deliberate. Remember the words of Kathleen Taylor, who worked with hospice patients in their final days. Once you're near the end, there's no time for bullshit. But what if you decide there's no time for bullshit or regrets far in advance of the end? What if you vow to live your life the way that you want to right now, regardless of what stage of life you're in? To truly live without regrets, pay attention, ask yourself hard questions, and see where they lead. Do I really want this job? Is this relationship right for me? If I could do anything, would it be what I'm doing today or would it be something different? People who live their lives in the pursuit of quests or adventures understand they have to be deliberate about doing things that matter. So this question really struck a chord with me or this point inside the book really struck a chord with me. At the end, was it worth it? And Kathleen Taylor worked with hospice patients in their final days. At the end, was it worth it? This is a powerfully motivating question. It's profoundly centering as well. At the end, will this matter? If I knew I only had one year left, would I keep doing what I'm doing right now? Will I be proud of who I'm being now when I don't have any time left? Sure, all of these seem like cliche phrases, but it's weird. In most cultures, we don't want to look at the fact that we have a limited time here. Of course, things like religion and etc. would say that we have more than just a limited time here. But I would just say, for sure, the only, the only thing that we know that we have as ourselves, as us, as our current iteration of ourselves, is this one chance. Instead, our intention is obviously, honestly just placed on what's right in front of us, the opinions of others, the path of society, and pleasure, not pain. Those are the things that we're kind of taught to focus on, rather than this question of, at the end, was it worth it? You know, this is a weird experience I'm having, but it might be the only one that I get. So at the end, was it worth it? And what would the Stoics say about this? That's what this really kind of struck a chord in me about. The Stoics have so many different meditations on death and so many different meditations on, am I living the good life? The Stoics, of course, they're known for those meditations on death. And I recommend that you check out the playlist on the 12 Stoic books on the channel. So I've done 12 different Stoic books. You can watch each one of them and find the different kind of philosophies of each of the different Stoic philosophers. You can find that on the channel as well. Seneca said, for example, a quick preview, let us prepare our minds as if we'd come to the very end of life. Let us postpone nothing. Let us balance life's books each day. The one who puts the finishing touches on their life each day is never short of time. And Marcus Aurelius said, you could leave life right now. Let that determine what you do and say and think. So if you're stuck in kind of a dead end job and you really want to get out, but you're afraid that you might not make it with your business, I would say, look at, was it worth it at the end? Was it worth it at the end? Will I wish that I took the leap at the end? Our next idea highlighted in red here is belief. Another one of the most important ideas from the book, I believe. You must believe that your quest can be successful, even if no one else does. You can deal with setbacks, misadventures, and even disasters, as long as you still believe that you can overcome the hardships and see your way to the very end. Whatever your quest, you too must believe. A desire for ownership and accomplishment, the fierce desire for control over one's life, these are all powerful forces. Being told that 
you can't do something is actually supremely motivating. So we talked about discontent before, but this kind of motivating factor of someone telling you you can't do something, I felt that a few times in my life, very, very powerfully motivating. Again, I would say not long lasting motivation as a kind of a progressive realization of the worthy goal would be, but short term motivation, someone telling you you can't do something is extremely powerful if you view it in the right way. There is joy in retelling of the stories. At one point in my research, I talked with someone who ran 50 marathons in a year. According to conventional wisdom, he said, you are not supposed to run a marathon every week, but that's why it's so satisfying. So really the big point here is that you can deal with setbacks, misadventures, and even disasters, as long as you still believe that you can overcome the hardships that you see your way to the end. And to me, what he's saying here is that all success really starts with a belief, a sneaking suspicion that we were meant to do something more than where we're currently at, more than in our current state. The understanding that if someone else has done it before that we can too is very powerful here. One exercise that I often recommend coaching clients when they're starting out a new business is to find someone that is already doing what they want to do and look at how they got there. Did they start out having everything all figured out? Oftentimes, the answer is no. Oftentimes, they might have even started from a worse starting position than you are, right? So that's a really good way to kind of cultivate some belief in yourself. The blind faith that if we put in the work, eventually it will all pay off. Now, the story of this YouTube channel is a great example. I put out probably 25 or 40 videos before anyone started paying attention. And even now, I still feel like I'm just starting to get some momentum. But I have a blind faith that if I put in the work, eventually all of this work is going to pay off. True belief is built and not found. Now, this is something very interesting. We talked about this exercise here before, and that's a good way to get some starter belief. But to me, real belief comes from looking back at our past actions and seeing that we've been able to accomplish things in the past. And this directly connects to what we talked about before with the quest, finding some small steps before you decide that I'm going to accomplish this big goal. Look at some small steps, not only because you're not going to know what the final steps actually look like, but because taking the first few steps and accomplishing something builds a true belief in yourself. Belief comes from looking at the steps we took towards our goal a week ago and realizing that we're actually moving towards it, that we can trust ourselves to actually do some of the work or actually take some real action. Belief comes from that. Belief is built by momentum. If you don't believe, one way is to look at someone else first to get some starting belief, but then take a few steps. Take the step to get the first paying customer, even if it's only a dollar, right? Let's say you're going to be a coach or you're going to start a YouTube channel or something like that. Put up one video. Or for example, get one person to pay you $1 for your coaching services. That is a really good way to kind of cultivate and foster just a little bit of belief. And then you take some more steps and you believe a little bit more. And you take a few more steps and you believe a little bit more. It's a really good way to kind of cultivate your own self-belief. Our final idea here is called grind. The long, slow grind of working hard towards something is all about loving the process. If you don't love the process, the grind is tough. The grind is also a dangerous time. It's when you're tempted to give up, to call it a day, or at the very least, cut some corners. Stephen Pressfield, who we've done book reviews of on this channel, author of dozens of books, says that the most important thing about art is to work. Nothing else matters except for sitting down every day and trying. So too, for a quest, the most important thing is continuing to make progress. So the idea here is to fall in love with the process and not necessarily the end result. Now, this is easier said than done because the end result is sexy. After all, it's the culmination of all of our hard work. It's finally been successful. That idea is seductive, but it actually is not very motivating. That's something that is spoken about quite a lot inside of Rethinking Positive Thinking by Gabriel Oettingen, another really great book. I recommend that. And just as an aside, I'm recommending a lot of books lately in the videos. 
I do recommend that you put those on your next watch list because those are the books that connect with this. And all of the ideas you'll notice as we get more and more into the mind maps, these ideas connect more and more and more together. So definitely check out some of the books that I'm recommending in the videos. Studies show that people who focus on the end result are more likely to be distracted and discouraged. And that's a big part of what Gabrielle Lote and Jen talks about. She says it's important to have an idea of what the outcome you want is, but then you need to focus on the actual steps. You need to focus on the plan. So of course, what should we focus on according to kind of Chris inside of this book? Well, self-mastery or becoming the highest version of ourselves. We get to compare ourselves against ourselves from the previous day, the previous week, the previous month, the previous year. Notice how much wisdom, self-confidence, and mastery you're gaining along the way towards the end. Because after all, it's not actually about the culmination of all that hard work, but it's about who you become along the way. You can fall in love with your craft and fall in love with getting better. This is self-perpetuating, self-motivating, and generates a lot of momentum. It's important as well because the end result won't last long. You might get to get your business to $100,000 a year and you know the next goal comes up. You, know, you want to make 250 or a million dollars a year. But you're going to spend years building that business. So you better like actually building the business and not just like the numbers that are showing up in your bank account. I want to thank you for being with me here today. If you want to skip the line a little bit, you want to actually kind of get my best ideas about goal setting, purpose, happiness, habits, mind mapping, learning, you can get that inside of the master classes that are all available on the mindmapguide.com and at the links below. I hope to see you in the next video.